they really have, uh, I think, made quite a, quite a meal of it. And there's a, the biggest problem I found uh, from the care home point of view is Nicola Sturgeon is very good at um, style over substance every lunchtime. She's absolutely uh, loved being there on screen every lunchtime. Um, this is not about politics, she keeps on saying, whereas it's totally about politics as far as she's concerned. It should be about people first, not politics, but it's very much been politics first and people second. But the biggest problem I found from the care home sector is the real disconnect between what's said from the podium, whether that's on PPE, on testing, on funding, hospital discharges, there's a real disconnect between what's said from the podium by Gene Freeman or by Nicola Sturgeon and what actually is experienced um, at the front line where we've been fighting this battle against invisible enemy COVID-19. And that's really, to me, been uh, the really um, standout thing, the difference between. It's easy to look in hindsight and say, what ifs, and we'll come to that, I'm sure. What could we and should we have done differently and better? Um, but the thing as far as for the journey that's really annoyed me in, uh, is this complete disconnect between podium statements um, and sound bites from the podium um, and the warm words of all the great things they're doing. But actually at the front line, it wasn't happening at all. The mistakes that we have made, uh, that we made in Scotland, have been basically a very slow start with testing. And I've been very critical of testing right throughout this because uh, they haven't really ramped up the testing to the degree they could have done. It's not that, you know, they, you had to develop a new test. Everybody had to do that. And the data was there to do that in the middle of January. But it was a very slow process in getting that testing rolling out so that you could do what World Health Organization Director General was saying, test, test, test. We're very slow to do that. So we really didn't know what was going on. And we had a lot of importation of the virus from Europe, not from China, from Europe, at the end of February, early March, which uh, by the time we knew we had the virus, it was almost too late in the sense of community, tra community transmission was well underway. So, okay, too late is perhaps a little bit uh, too strong, but... Um, there was a, a, a big delay in getting to grips with the virus and finding out where it was, finding out how it was affecting people throughout the country because it came in both to Shetland and, and, and to the borders pretty well at the same time and started causing outbreaks. And uh, this is a virus that is well known to cause outbreaks. We knew this from China that basically many of the um, basically cases occur in, in outbreaks. Um, and we were really slow to put that together into a picture and say, let us hunt down these outbreaks and put people into, basically into self-isolation. We were very slow to do that. And as a consequence of that, the virus has got out into the community. And in particular, in particular, we've done very poorly in Scotland at protecting residents in care homes. The first and most absolutely critical thing to do is to stop the virus getting into care homes. You can only do that if you're doing lots and lots of testing. So I come back to testing as being our biggest weakness, not enough of it, not being done uh, basically at the right time um, and not the right people being tested either. Certainly on... Um on PPE, we fortunately at Renaissance Care never ran out of PPE, but we ran low on a few occasions. And we only got one delivery of one week supply from the Scottish Government. You would think from a lot of the things the Scottish Government have said that they were constantly supplying us with PPE, but that was not, that was not the case. On testing, they completely weren't, were just not keen, despite us asking for it, for um, regular testing of all care home staff. Um, and it was something which, um, even when they were saying from the podium that it's now happening, it was very much of a postcode lottery on testing. Um, uh, it was very uh, postcode lottery um, uh, testing of staff, particularly staff. Um, and that was a concern that we got rubbished about initially. And I suppose it's easy in hindsight 
to bring it up again is the asymptomatic um, uh, testing of staff, the testing of staff who were asymptomatic. Because when we finally did start to get some mass testing, some blitz testing from these army units, um, the mobile army units to some of our care homes, um, the results were, I mean, we were getting uh, about seven and a half percent of our staff that had no symptoms were testing positive. And over 10, 10 and a half percent of residents with no symptoms were testing positive. Um, and when that was raised by journalists with Scottish government, Nicola Sturgeon actually on one occasion said, well, um, I'm told that, that if somebody who has no symptoms but tests positive, they are much less infectious, was how she uh, put it, uh, than somebody with symptoms. Um, and so it, it was something that, that and, and um, uh, Professor Hugh uh, Pennington is so, so right that, I mean, the R number, once it gets in, um, I think um, the R number could be said to be north of 10 in care homes once it's actually in there. Um, um, and so he was quite right that the, the, the key thing is to stop it getting in there in the first place. But they were constantly blaming NHS trust for not delivering um, enough testing. Um, and that was, you know, we don't blame anybody else, we take the blame, but they were very, very good at um, uh, deflecting blame uh, for anything and everything to, if it wasn't to care homes for not doing the correct social distancing or the correct um, uh, infection control. Uh, but as you said, we are used to dealing with non uh, noroviruses and flu epidemics on a, on a regular basis, and we had PPE. Um, uh, for these kind of um, outbreaks. That's what we normally deal with and our staff are quite used to that. Um, so on PPE, on testing and on funding, again, they said uh, we're giving all this money to care homes to help them out. Um, we filled in 10 different councils that we deal with. We filled in, uh, had to fill in 10 different, well, nine different claim forms because one of the 10 councils that we deal with, which is Murray Council, haven't yet produced a claim form for us to use. But the other nine produced nine completely different claim form processes. So we had to do the same thing in nine different ways, um, uh, which was hugely uh, bureaucratic for us to do. Um, but actually we have claimed as what we've been told to claim for by uh, COSLA and the Scottish Government um, on each, to each of these councils. And we have to date received 1%, 1% of what we were told we could claim for, we have received. So again, it's a disconnect between what is said from the podium that we are supporting care homes. Care homes are not second class, care home residents and staff are not second class citizens. Whereas in fact, we have found throughout this that it's NHS first and care home staff and residents second. And I worry that actually, as we prepare for the winter, uh, and uh, uh, got a bit a second um, uh, wave um, mm -hmm. that it's again seems to be all the talk about NHS first um, and social care and care home second. Um, we're about to, are we going to go through all this again? I think they could have done um, because um, let's face it, public health it, it's not it, not it's been devolved, it was never undevolved. Mm -hmm. Public health has always been a Scottish um, um, task and duty, irrespective of what Westminster says. Okay, some of the money comes from Westminster, all that kind of thing. But going back into the 19th century, you know, Scotland ran its own public health and its own hospitals and all the rest of it. And even the NHS was set up in Scotland by a different act of parliament from, from England. So, you know, Scotland has always had powers uh, to basically cope with uh, public health issues, with infectious diseases and all sorts of other health problems. And I don't see any other, I don't see any reason why if Scotland had said, um, let us have a lockdown, because we see the virus getting out of control, they could have done it. And it might have had to be done on a local authority basis. You know, you lock down Glasgow because that was where a large number of cases has been and there, have been, there were early outbreaks in the central belt and so on. But I don't see any, any constitutional reason why Scotland couldn't have moved at its own pace on lockdown. Um, 
there, there's no, there was no, there was no legal reason why they couldn't have done it. They could have done it, and if they'd chosen to do it, clearly, uh, we might have been in a better position. So that's the one, the, the one thing that I feel um, when asked: Is there anything that that Renaissance Care could have done with uh, looking after the 15 care homes and 700 residents that we have and 1,100 staff? Um, and I do feel that we could or should have locked down earlier. We did a partial lockdown on the 1st of March. We did a full lockdown on the 11th of March in advance of the 23rd of March um, deadline across all of our 15 care homes. Uh, and I, I don't see, and, and, and that's really interesting, that I don't see that the Scottish Government need extra powers going forward to be able to do a lockdown. Um, and I see lockdowns going forward in the winter and the spring more likely to be localised anyway. Um, as you say, to under local government, um, local authority um, areas more than, uh, than nationally rather than a, a national lockdown. But they had the powers, they chose to follow the UK advice. They could have gone earlier if they decided um, to do so, but Presumably, they were following the same scientific advice as London was. Following the same scientific advice, except they had there, there, there is a, a Scottish advisory committee with scientists advising the Scottish government on top of the advice that's coming from London. And I mean, the the, the, the remit of that committee, the Scottish committee, is to look at what Sage uh, is saying and, and digest it in a way. For, for Scottish purposes, if there are any Scottish, uh, particular Scottish reasons why they should take a different line or you know, speed things up or slow things down, um, that was the function of the committee. That is the function of the committee. I mean, care homes were not, as has been said by Matt Hancock, they were certainly not um, uh, a, a priority from the start. And they did not put, again, what Matt Hancock said, a protective ring around care homes. That is a complete uh, fiction. Um, and it really annoys me when they, they, they make comments like that. Um, it just wasn't the case. We were left um, as second class because they were terrified of the NHS being overwhelmed mm. because of what happened in northern Italy and to a certain extent in parts of Spain. And that, that was what they were terrified of. Um, and that's why it was NHS first and social care second. Absolutely. The, the whole emphasis was on protecting the NHS from the, uh, the Italian, the North it Italian sort of situation. And again, with all the emphasis on ventilators and intensive care and all the rest of it, uh, it of course, things have turned out a bit differently in the sense that you know, yeah. vent ventilators have not turned out to be uh, as, as beneficial as was thought at the time. But never mind, that's, that, that's something that, you know, we'll have, to, we'll have to look again in, you know, when, when things have settled down, because clearly people have got better at treating the very sick people with, with COVID-19 over time, because in fact, you almost have expected that to happen. But that's a separate issue from the, this protecting the NHS, sweeping out all the patients who uh, could have been discharged and went because they didn't have somewhere to go, sweeping them out almost by, you know, by, by fiat, as it were. Uh, and of course, that's created problems. And we certainly had a lot of hospital discharges um, as they were um, uh, moving people from hospital who didn't medically need to be there anymore. The bed blockers um, uh, that have always been in the system, both in Scotland and in, uh, in England. Uh, and a huge number of those were moved, there were 921 moved in March, and a further 510, I think it was, or 501 uh, in April, uh, up to the point, 21st of April. And this is why I don't understand that, that based on this scientific advice, all these um, up to the 20, in Scotland, up to the 21st of April, there were hospital discharges um, into care homes with no testing. In England, they started the testing on the 15th of uh, April, and it took an extra six days for Scotland to um, insist on two, same as in England, two negative tests before a resident or 
a hospital patient was discharged to a care home. And I don't understand the disconnect between those six days, because six days in this um, pandemic it, it is actually a long, it's a long time. Um, and I don't understand, maybe Hugh has a better idea um, on, on why there was this six day disconnect. I can't explain it at all on, on any kind of scientific grounds or any clinical grounds. Uh, one might mention sort of administrative reasons, but of course that's not a good reason. No. That, that's another way of saying incompetence, but never mind, never mind. Um, but of course we know there was big, big worry right from the beginning with this virus that there would be hospital transmission, nosocomial transmission of the virus. And so the likelihood of patients in hospital catching the virus while they were in hospital for some other reason, uh, and, and not necessarily in the part of the hospital that was treating patients with COVID, was very real. And in fact, it may have turned out to be overemphasized, but never mind, never mind. There, there have been a, clearly it demonstrated instances of happening. And you think there would be a, a fantastic sort of focus on if you're sending someone out of hospital who might have caught the virus, you want to find out whether they have or not. And the only way you can do that, the only way you can do that is to test them and have a regime in place which does it as, a, as this is a sort of, you know, this is your passport out of the hospital. One of the things on the passport is what are the test results uh, that have been obtained? And they, they would have to be negative as well, of course, uh, before, yes. you, before you send them uh, out to a place which is full of people who are, who are ex really, really um, so susceptible to harm from the virus. You know, the, the formula is a very easy one to work out. Well, I think the hospital, um, there's a lot of people who are in hospital for other reasons. Um, I'm not talking about the elderly who are bed blocking, but I'm talking about a lot of people were in hospital that apparently picked up COVID in hospital, even though they were in there for something completely different. And those figures were kind of, um, uh, I mean, getting data out of the Scottish government uh, has been like getting blood out of a stone during all of this um, uh, a roller coaster ride that, that we've been on. But because we had, we were worried about in care homes, um, well, certainly Renaissance Care did, we were worried about um, whether we were being told the correct information um, by the hospitals. And on two occasions, um, we were proven uh, um, to be, be right to do that. We treated every hospital admission. Uh, as positive, and we uh, isolated on admission, and we barrier nursed for the correct period, and used PPE. So did did all that we should have done. Um, and on two occasions, one it was the next day we were told, another one it was half an hour after the person had been admitted, when we had been told it had two negatives. We were subsequently told um, uh, that the second test it was a mistake. The second test was in fact positive. Um, so it was quite fortunate that we had this policy in place of treating every admission from hospital as... So I don't feel that that was behind the... I think probably the asymptomatic staff was probably maybe more responsible for uh, the explosion in care homes, um, uh, apart from the fact that once, as Hugh, you said, the R number, and I think you said this before, you reckon the R number in care homes, once it got into a care home was probably north of 10. Have you not said that before? I have indeed, yes, yes. I mean, a simple calculation depends on how many cases there are, how many introductions. We assume there's been one introduction in a care home. If you have 10 cases, the R number is 10. It's as simple as that. It's a very straightforward calculation to do. Of the 15 care homes, we had 10 of our 15 care homes that had either a definite confirmed uh, experience um, uh, with COVID-19 or a suspected um, uh, brush with COVID. And in those um, 10 uh, of our 15 care homes, um, in eight of them, we tragically had 48 um, residents die following a positive um, test. But equally, we had 91 residents um, uh, throughout those homes recover from having been uh, tested positive, including one uh, gentleman who I know his name, but I won't uh, say his name, but he's 100, 102 and he, he got it tragically and uh, recovered. Um, so we only about 
three or four of those 91 had gone to hospital and had then come back um, uh, after they'd been treated in the hospital, the vast majority um, of those 91 were uh, cared for and looked after um, at the care home by the carers and the nurses um, in our care homes. And that was a decision made by uh, the care home manager, the family and the local GP. We certainly, I know some people have said they had difficulty getting um, people admitted to hospital, but we certainly didn't um, uh, have that um, at all. Um, so we, we, we certainly didn't have uh, a problem. So that was our, but we had our, I said about the 1st of March partial lockdown, the 11th of March full lockdown. We started all staff, again ahead of government guidelines, all staff wearing masks at all occasions from the 1st of April. And that was completed throughout all of our 15 care homes by about the 19th or 20th of April. But we had our first positive case on April the 3rd in one of our Edinburgh homes. And on Monday, June the 15th, 73 days later, um, all our homes were um, COVID-19 free. So that 73 day roller coaster ride um, that, that we had, um, which is not something that that any of us would want to obviously experience again. I would say I know of uh, care home operators who uh, uh, have had a worse, worse experience than us. Um, uh, but equally, I know ones who've had a better experience than us. So I'd like to say that we were probably, um, I felt um, as this uh, started, I felt we were pretty well prepared, but um, obviously, um, I think the biggest regret that I have, if I could have my time again, if you like, and it's what we're definitely looking at doing, and we've done it twice, actually, um, in the last week. Um, uh, I, would, I would like to have shut down earlier. I would like to have had a full shutdown on the 1st of March, if I had my time again, rather than wait till the 11th of March. That's my regret. But twice in the last week, we've had a resident who showed symptoms at one of our homes, and we immediately stopped um, relatives, uh, all relatives visiting, um, even though the, uh, that was happening outdoors only and still is happening outdoors only, until we got a negative back from uh, that resident testing. And equally, at another care home, we had a member of staff showing symptoms. And again, we immediately stopped all uh, relatives visiting, even though, again, outside only at the moment. Um, until that was tested, um, uh, the test results were back and they were negative. So I think it, it, it's, it's, this is part, us in our own small company with 15 care homes across Scotland, we're absolutely uh, operating a local lockdown at the slightest um, uh, sign of any uh, symptoms amongst staff or, or residents. And I think that's how it's probably, as you said earlier, going to happen through probably local authority areas, um, uh, with Glasgow being the most populous one and therefore the one that is probably going to be uh, the most difficult decision to make because of the effect on the economy. And, and uh, one of the key things that we're doing at the moment is uh, implementing lessons learned um, uh, to prepare ourselves uh, better mm. for um, uh, a second wave, God forbid, um, than, uh, looking in hindsight and self being self-critical looking back what more could we have done unfortunately it's very difficult to to know exactly what happened because a report hasn't been published we, we do know from other studies looking at the uh, sort of fingerprinting the viruses that it, it didn't lead to as far as we know any more cases in scotland it did lead to cases elsewhere because uh, it was an international outbreak, um, but we haven't seen a um, you know an in incident management team report. When you've got an outbreak, um, as some, somebody who's been involved in looking at outbreaks over the years, they're a fantastic um, opportunity to learn things about what happened and what did, what went well and what what went, what went wrong. And you know the whole of epidemiology for infectious diseases is actually based on studying outbreaks because single cases are much more difficult. You don't know how they caught it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But outbreaks, you know what the common factor is behind 
at that particular outbreak and so on. I don't have to go into any detail, but it, it's a, it's an absolute no break. You know, it, 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 it's it's the, the meat and drink. It's like you know, seismologists study earthquakes, you know, to find out what's going to happen. And it's the same with epidemiology. You have to study outbreaks to find out what happened. And unless you publish the data, how can you learn anything from them? And in New Zealand, where they've published details of all the outbreaks, not you know, it's it's. They're not treading on anybody's, you know, confidential information, but they're telling you enough detail to know exactly what happened and why they had the policies they did and how those policies evolved and so on. And in Scotland, we just haven't had that data at all. We have precious little from England as well, I would have to say. But this is something which is amazing to me as somebody who's been in this game for many years that we're still waiting for the details of all the outbreaks which we know have happened, because we know that this virus specializes in causing outbreaks. You know, in New Zealand, 40% of the cases were actually in outbreaks. And we know that this has happened. South Korea has published its, its outbreak reports in, in great detail. And so, and, you know, many other countries have done this, but somehow um, Scotland has not done this. And I think this is something that's going to get in the way of us being prepared. Five out of ten I agree, is is about fair, and that's a big concern I have. Is is are they prepared to learn very quick lessons? Fine, we have a big review next year um, on what went wrong, what could have been done better, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and who did the wrong thing at the wrong time, etc. Um, that's for a much much bigger review. What lessons have we learned? What can we and do we need to put in place now? Uh, against uh, the risk of a second wave. That's what Scottish government need to do. That's what the UK government need to do, um, and uh, do a quick one now because we might the second wave um, could be just tragically could be just round the corner. But they could have locked down, as Hugh said earlier. They had their own advisory council as well as Sage. Um, they have the they have the powers under devolution to shut down. They could have shut down and locked down the whole of Scotland. Um, but then we come down to, I, I suppose we do come down to money. Because if Scotland had locked down ahead of UK, um, who was going to pay for that lockdown? I suppose that's what we come to. Yeah. And um, the, you know, it's not rocket science. I mean, the, the, the Scottish government don't have uh, the funding. They're, they're, um, with the Bank of England printing money uh, at, and making available to the government, the UK government, at 0%, yeah. um, and the Scottish government um, giving under the Barnet formula um, uh, money to uh, the Scottish Parliament. Um, that's how the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish government, have been able to fund um, supporting various aspects of uh, and areas of the economy. The experience um, uh, of what's gone on in local authority care homes uh, has been something that they've been very much wanting to keep a veil of secrecy over what's been going on in local authority care homes. About 15, 16% of care homes in Scotland are uh, owned and run by local authorities. And they have been very, very uh, uh, reticent about uh, giving any uh, information out. There's no reason why they can't give the kind of information that I've given um, uh, uh, just a short time ago about what our group-wide experience through COVID has been. Um, you know, Fife Council could do that, or Glasgow City Council could do that, or Aberdeen City Council could do that. They don't have to identify it to individual homes, the same as I have refused to give out to um, the media um, any individual uh, experience, uh, care home experience within our group. I've been, I've been okay about giving out group-wide experience because I think it's important for the data to be there but it, it really annoys me that that um, the Scottish government have been uh, I mean getting data out of them is just impossible they've been really keen on trying to pull this veil of secrecy over what's been going on in local care homes local authority run care homes and yet they've certainly been uh, um, very keen from the podium to say that there should be transparency and the scrutiny of of what's gone on in, in independent sector care homes. And yes, 
you know, Renaissance Care is a private company, but 70% of our residents are, um, we're a private company providing a public service because 70% of our residents are local authority um, clients. And so I think it's not fair. And certainly when we have a review, a fuller review, as we rightly should have, um, and that can include all sorts of things, whether you want to talk about a national care service and uh, happy to look at absolutely everything. As long as it's not a kangaroo court um, that the Scottish government are, are looking to set up to beat up the independent sector care homes. Um, it has to be including the care home experience across all sectors, voluntary, independent sector, and local authority care homes. It cannot be just a one sector um, witch hunt because I fear that's what the Scottish yeah. government is looking to do. And independent Scotland would have done pretty well exactly what it's been doing. Um, I don't see any reason why it could have been, um, why it would have done anything different because it was going on scientific advice, not scientific advice necessarily from SAGE down in London or, or from its own people, but international advice, uh, international information. And that's all you can go on. In the early stages, we had to rely pretty well, pretty well, absolutely on what was coming out of China. And generally speaking, that's turned out to be good in the sense that that information has been very useful. It's told you who the people were at mo a particular risk, you know, the elderly particularly at risk, uh, and all this kind of thing. As we've moved on, we've, we've filled in some of the, the gaps in that information. But basically, everybody has been working from the same hymn sheet in, in all countries in the world. Um, now, how they've dealt with it has been different how they've reacted to it, have they taken it as seriously as they might, have they moved fast enough. Sometimes the differences are really quite small and one can't re read too much in them. But um, I, I don't see any, 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 any factors that an independent Scotland would have used that would have made things any better. Um, it could have been worse, but I, I can't see any reason. And of course, if you look, for example, at other countries of a similar size to Scotland, like yeah. the Republic of Ireland, they've had more cases than we've had in Scotland. Okay, they've, they've escaped some of the big problems in care homes, um, but they've had big, big problems in meat plants in the Republic of Ireland, yeah. for example. But they've not done any better despite the fact they haven't had to rely on SAGE, they've had their own advisory committees, but they've had to go back to this information coming out of China and South Korea and other countries to find out exactly how to cope with the virus. And they've done pretty well the same as everybody else in Europe in terms of coping with the virus. And nobody in Europe has done particularly well. We had a very bad experience because a lot of people were coming home from parts of Europe, which was the, which was the, the center of the epidemic, Italy and, and Spain and Austria, mm. some came from, from Switzerland. And that was very early March. The virus got itself very well established. And then we started exporting it to countries like Iceland and so on. I think to basically say that independence would have made a jot of difference in terms of the overall way that Scotland has handled the, um, the, the outbreak is it, just a load of old rubbish, basically. Um, being part of the UK has been absolutely essential to the Scottish economy and the S Scottish business. Um, where would the uh, Scottish Government have got the money um, uh, for all the schemes that the Chancellor has put in place um, to support business across several different, um, all sectors? Um, it's not just that, it's coming out of lockdown um, and over the next few years, um, uh, we're going to really need and benefit from, in my view, huge benefit of Scotland for Scottish business investment jobs to be part of the UK. Um, it's absolutely, a, it, it's a great thing um, that we're part of the UK. It is our biggest uh, single market. Um, and it's absolutely essential that Scotland is um, not just through the pandemic, but for the years to come, that Scotland remains part of the UK because we are going to need, Scotland's going to need um, a lot of support uh, in the recovery. I mean, the, uh, the thought of how uh, the Scottish government would have funded the kind of schemes. I mean, they're very good, the Scottish government, 
at taking money from Westminster and putting uh, a, a kilt Kill or a soul tire on it uh, and presenting it as their scheme. Um, they're exceptionally good at, at doing that. Again, it's style over substance. They're very good at doing that. They could have shut down earlier. Um, uh, they didn't. Um, and perhaps they will admit at some point that that was a mistake not to do that. Um, but from a, fu a funding financial point of view, I just don't understand where this money was going to come from, uh, where they expect um, ex this money uh, to support businesses and employees um, that the Chancellor has been able to provide where this would have come from in an independent Scotland. It's just uh, fantasy land, frankly. Can I just put in another point about London being of help? That when the virus first came to Scotland, all the testing was done by sending the samples to the Collendale Lab Public Health England in London, the lab with which I'm very familiar over the years, because I used to be the Scottish rep visiting them to see how they were getting on and all that kind of stuff. And they have a very, very good uh, molecular sort of section that could develop the test, which they did, you know, they, within about 48 hours of the information being published by the Chinese on a WHO website in the middle of, of January. And we in Scotland had to send our test samples down there to know exactly what was going on at the beginning, uh, because we don't have a lab of that equivalent in Scotland. Uh, and even going to the reasons, but it goes way back into the dim and distant parts of history that why we don't have a central lab like that. Now, if we'd been independent, we might have set one up, but I've never seen any policy um, comment about that from the point of view of uh, what, what an independent Scotland would have done. I suspect they wouldn't have bothered, but that's, you know, that, that's pure guesswork. But we were reliant on that facility to get things going um, and you could say, well, what, what did they do in the Republic of Ireland? Well, they sent their samples to Germany and they ran into problems because they had uh, a slow return from, from that. Um, so, you know, being independent in itself uh, w would probably have hindered that early response, even if the early response was, was not speedy enough and not rapid enough. But as it turned out, with all the dev all the devolution and all the historical separation between Scotland and England in terms of public health, which is which is really really quite start quite quite uh, quite marked. If you look at the details, we have all sorts of different policies on many things between Scotland and England, and have had for more than a hundred years. We are looking currently at how we have smaller care homes and we have some medium, and we have a few. Uh, larger ones. Um, our largest one has 81 beds. Um, we're looking about how we can break up um, within that um, 81 bed care home into smaller, say, three separate uh, bubble units. This is all part of preparing um, for, um, uh, against God forbid, a second wave, including buying air purifying uh, machines, um, thermal imaging cameras, um, lots of things that we've been looking at uh, doing, doing differently. 25 beds, for example, it's probably got something like 35 to 38 part and full-time staff. If a care home has 80 beds, it probably has about 120 to 125 part and full-time staff. Um, and I think that is probably with the great increase in the number of uh, uh, staff involved, um, uh, that that is probably where uh, the difference between the smaller. Yes, from the, from the point of view of infection, um, entry into a home, in a sense, the fewer people coming and going, the less likely um, the, the virus has a chance of getting in. And, and, and clearly, if, you, if you've got your, then got your care home separated into sort of physically separate parts. Again, the likelihood of the virus spreading, which is very, very difficult to prevent in, in terms of um, it's an airborne virus. And they're still arguing as to the, the, you know, the, the role of, of droplets as, a, as against aerosols and so on. I think you can take it that you know, the virus can spread on the wind, as it were, inside uh, uh, premises and so on. And the more you can reduce that by having physical separation, 
um, the less likely you are to have a bigger outbreak. So, you know, these are just basic sound principles of I infection control. But if you have a very large number of people gathered together in, in, in one space and the virus gets in, uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a care home or a pub or, or you know, any other function, you're going to have a lot more cases. And we know that. from Yeah, and, and we're looking at things like um, having separate entrances for the various bubbles that we can try and break up um, a larger care home into because there's no point breaking them up into bubbles and then having the same entrance and exit. So we're looking at how, um, how, how we do that. But another, another thing that, that has really annoyed me about the Scottish government's attitude um, or uh, the way they've handled um, this, because um, it does seem to be that um, uh, the narrative that public sector is good and private sector is bad um, increasingly um, is what they have fallen back on, that it's all the private sector's fault and the public sector is, uh, is brilliant. We're back to, again, um, it should be about people, not politics, um, is my view. Um, uh, and it really annoys me when, um, in fact, Nicola Sturgeon even says um, from the podium, that it should be about people, not politics. And then she proceeds to uh, um, uh, make it about politics, um, which um, is really both disappointing and annoying. That in quite a lot of things around PPE and testing, um, that they did too little too late um, on, on quite a number uh, of areas. Um, and when you've got SAGE, which I understand there are about 100 members of SAGE, is that correct, you? Uh, yes, yes, getting on for 100, yeah. I mean, you know, it, it's taking advice from uh, 100 scientists um, uh, and saying, you know, we're following the scientific advice, but there are 100, um, I don't know how many scientists it takes to change a light bulb, but I mean, um, surely you don't need a hundred, but um, uh, uh, it, it does seem to me it is um, the governments of, of, of both Scotland and uh, uh, the UK down in London have used um, uh, falling on, we're following the scientific um, uh, advice and the medical advice is, has been their kind of stock um, uh, defense about practically um, everything. That's right. Yes, we're following the science. And of course, what there isn't, there isn't any such thing as the science. There are scientific no. views, scientific opinions. You'll get in a, in a, in a, in a, a sage size committee, you'll get nearly as many opinions as there are members of the committee because yeah. people will be coming at it from different positions. There are behavioral scientists, there are microbiologists, and you know, there are even people with an interest in economics on those committees. And Clearly, not all of them will, will carry the day. And it's the chairs of this committee, the chair of those committees, who's going to then pass the information on to uh, onto the politicians. And of course, at the end of the day, it's the politicians who have to take the rap because the politicians, basically the scientists advise and, and the politicians decide. So it, it's pointless to try and say, we're following the science because they're getting scientific advice. A lot of that advice was clearly basically influenced by what has happened in the past because we had, you know, we had the swine flu pandemic, which turned out to be almost a non-event because only 450 people died. Although there were predictions being made at that time that the next one would kill mm -hmm. half a million people or 50,000. And the big difference between MERS and COVID is MERS is much nastier in terms of mortality. And it probably spreads in a different way as well in the sense that with MERS and SARS, asymptomatic transmission wasn't seen as isn't seen as a problem. With SARS, we had the temperature checks at airports, which was a good way of finding out whether anybody had it, because people were not infectious until they had a fever. Whereas it's just the opposite with, with COVID-19, that many of the people, even who have symptoms, don't have a fever. Uh, and there are people who have no symptoms at all who are infectious. And I think that's one of the big criticisms I have of Scottish government, where they've been saying until relatively recently, um, until towards the end of May, that doing a test on somebody who's not symptomatic is a waste of time. The test is unreliable. And, you know, Nicola Sturgeon was saying this at her, at her press conferences, 
And, you know, th this is just plain wrong in terms of what we already knew about this virus, that one of the reasons it's caused so much mayhem is it, it's easy for it to get under the radar because it can transmit from people who don't have any symptoms, who don't know they've got it. 